All right, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. In this letter to the Romans, Paul has taken us from how we got to be in the mess in the first place. And that was to not because mankind, people in general, everyone, no longer worship God as God. We lost sight of that. As you remember, it began in the garden <laughs> with Adam and Eve. They didn't believe that, that they were... They were tricked. Did God really say that? Did he really mean what he said? Sometimes we ask those questions ourselves, don't we? But it says there in Romans chapter 1 that they didn't glorify God as God. They didn't like to retain knowledge of him. They didn't worship him. They wanted to change the image of God into that of, of men and creatures and all sorts of things. They wanted to change God, bring him down to our level in some way. And sometimes below that. We changed God, and because of that, and them not wanting to worship Him, people not wanting to worship them, He gave them over to their retrobate minds to do all the things that we see going on in the world today. He says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know in that verse right there, we find the very definition of sin. It's not complete, absolute rebellion against God, but falling short of the glory of God. And I think when we look at that and understand what that means, we don't have any problem at all putting ourselves in that category of all, because all does mean all. Fall short of the glory of God, even though we may try, we fall short. And then he tells us that the wages of sin is death. Not just that physical death of the body, but separation from God. We are born spiritually dead. We are born condemned of sin. And only by accepting the free gift of life that Jesus gave us, that free gift of salvation that He bought for us when He went to the cross and paid the price for our sins, so that he could forgive us. That debt had to be paid. And Jesus came and paid that price on that cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Our sin, my sin, your sin. If anybody ever asked you who, who put Jesus on the cross, you make sure you tell them that you did. Because it was for your sin, for your transgression. For you're falling short of the glory of God. That he was beaten and nailed to the cross. He tells us, but the gift, the free gift, is everlasting life in Christ Jesus. That if we believe and trust in him, that he sets us free from the, the, the punishment of sin. It's paid for. We don't have to worry about that. That if we believe and trust in Him, that we be free from the bondage of sin in our life. That sin that controls us. That we now have the choice to present ourselves to sin as slaves or to righteousness as slaves. We have that choice now in Christ Jesus. Talks about how we are born again. And now that the old man, that old sinful person has died and passed away, crucified with Christ, and to reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ. We put off the old man and put on the new, the Christ, that we're born again. And make no mistake, you must be born again. Jesus very plainly states that in John chapter 3 as he's talking to Nicodemus. So that was born of water, our flesh is that. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And in that, that new nature, that new creature, not a revised old one, not a remodel job, not one of those uh, ambush makeover things, 
but a new creature in Christ. And we are alive spiritually because the Holy Spirit of God Himself is dwelling in us. And our life is no longer ours, it's not our own. But we were bought with a precious price. Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and lives through me. So we have a newness of life and we're free from the indwelling sin. He goes on to talk about how we are adopted in, as sons. It says in verse 15 of chapter 8, it says, For you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. For the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children then heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. We're adopted into his family. Again, that, say, that question that, that most people have, aren't we all his children? And we know that the answer to that is no. Every human being, every person ever born is his creature. He's a creator. But we're not all his children. If we were his children, we would not be adopted into the family. There wouldn't be that spirit of adoption. But because we are adopted, we now cry out, Abba, Father. And that term there, that, that, that word Abba, it's that personal, that intimate, that relational one. We cry out, Daddy, Papa. Whatever it is, whatever that affectionate term that you have for your father might be, it's that. And the scribes, the Pharisees, the Jews, and everyone, when they heard Jesus talking about that, when, they talked, when he talked about our Father who art in heaven, they went, whoa, he's the Father, but our Father, that's too intimate. But it speaks of the intimate relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father in heaven. We call him Abba, Father. And as children, as adopted children, as His children, we have special access to Him. Hebrews tells us to come boldly before His throne in our time of need. That boldness, that's not arrogance. That's a boldness that a kid would come to their parent. We come boldly to our Father. We have access to Him as a child does to their Abba their papa, their daddy. And the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children. The Holy Spirit dwelling in us, that down payment that we have of the Holy Spirit in our life, showing us the reality of our salvation and our relationship with Christ. Apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from having that spiritual life, these are words on a page that don't mean much to anyone. You may study them, you may know them, you may be able to work your way through them backwards and forwards. But apart from that spiritual life, apart from the Holy Spirit, they're just words on a page that you may study and know about God the Creator. But it's not the same as having that relationship with God the Father. God, your Father. And the Holy Spirit makes this real. And these words from this page become our Father, our Abba, speaking to us personally and directly. And it means so much to us. It means life. It means love. It grows us. It nourishes us. It nurtures us. No other words on paper can do that. It's the Holy Spirit that bears witness and if we're, child, if we're children, it says in verse 17, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That privileged access that we have. I can remember when I, I was a kid and I talked about this last time. I, I could bring my friends over, you know, and they had access to my house and some of the things there because they were my friends. 
But it wasn't the same as me and the access that I had to my house, my father's house. I could go over to the, to, to the refrigerator, pop it open and look around in there and dig out whatever I wanted and eat. I could share that with my friends. But they didn't have that same access. They didn't have the same access, the same relationship that I did with my father. That we're heirs because it was ours. It says there in the last part of verse 17, it says, If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now that doesn't mean that you're not saved unless somebody beats you up for being a Christian. Although that happened to Paul quite regularly, it seems. All kinds of things. But it means that if we're willing to make that stand, if we're willing to, as Jesus said, deny ourselves. That right there is often a very difficult thing to do, isn't it? Deny ourselves. Sometimes physically. Sometimes in the way that we think. It says that we need to have our minds renewed. That we be transformed by the renewing of our minds, by being in the Word. Sometimes that means denying how we feel, because our feelings don't always line up with what the Word of God says that we ought to do. And sometimes we need to deny that and do that. It's about self-denial and making that stand for what we know to be right and true in the Word of God. We don't suffer much, do we? Sometimes verbally. There are those that talk about the things that we believe in as Christians, call us foolish for believing all that old stuff. Some of the things that we we believe in, some of the places where we make our stands for what the Word of God says is right and wrong. Some would call us haters because of that. Every once in a while you hear of someone in this country getting into some sort of physical altercation from someone who's coming against them, persecuting them as believers. We don't suffer like so many of our brothers and sisters, our fellow Christians around the world do. Where it means oftentimes their very life, their livelihood, their families and those that are closest to them. To make that stand for Christ. We suffer if we're willing to deny ourselves and take up our cross no matter what it costs us temporally to follow Him. We're willing to make that sacrifice as it were. Verse 18, he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope? For what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Let's stop right there for a moment. Verse 18. He says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That suffering, that self-denial, the things that we may give up, the things that we may not do as Christians, the persecution that may can't come our way for standing for the Lord and His righteousness, those things, those things that we deal with now. And Paul, in his context, is talking about things 
far worse than what we know here. He says, I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What could we give up now that would even come close to what we gain in Christ? What does the world have to offer you now? We sing that song, More Precious Than Gold and Silver and all that. What does the world have to offer you now that is worth more than the blessing that we have in Christ and being obedient and following Him? There are many of us that, that, that as we get saved and we come to Christ and we live our life, we find that, that there are relationships in our life that maybe we have to put down or put aside and, and, and deal with in a certain way. And sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes it's hard to put distance between us and them. And yet sometimes that's exactly what we need to do. Sometimes we have to we find ourselves in situations where we have to do things that we wouldn't normally do. You know, like get up early on Sunday morning and come to church. When after all, you know, maybe one of your favorite teams is playing sports someplace. Some of the things that we do, some of the things that we do as believers, and sometimes we do it just to discipline ourselves. Take that extra time on Tuesday morning or in the morning to have a little time and maybe say a prayer or two and read a verse or two of Scripture before you go off into your day. And think about the things that we, as believers in this country and our culture, give up for the Lord. And sometimes with those when they're first saved, especially if they get saved later in life, it can be difficult. Because more than just those things and everything, when we come to Christ and part of putting that old man to death if we, is we have to give up our identity. We have to give up who we are and become who we are in Him. That new creature that grows into His likeness. And sometimes that's difficult. And yet what have we given up? What did you miss? What have you given up? That even comes close to the blessings that we know in Christ. That even comes close when we consider our salvation. Not to mention the relationship and walking with Him daily and all that that we have. But our salvation. What would you trade? What does this world have? That you would trade for your salvation. Not a thing. Paul says, yeah, you know what? We might have to suffer. There might be some hardships. People might come down on us. They might attack us. There might be some physical things. There might be some separating ourselves from the world. There might be some uncomfortable moments in our life. But what is that compared to the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus? How does that compare? What would you trade for your relationship with Christ? It's easy for me to stand up here and talk to you about that because I remember being out in the world. I didn't get saved till I was 27, and before that I knew nothing of the Lord and a lot about the world. And all the things that I thought were important and mattered and meant something to me in my life when I came to Christ compared to Him and the relationship I had with Him were nothing. There's not one thing I would go back for. And nothing that I would hang on to so tightly that I wouldn't drop it to receive whatever blessing He had. Sometimes as Christians, as believers, we hang on to things in our life. We hang on to stuff, to, to earthly things, to, to, to whatever. And the Lord says, you need to set that down. You need to not depend on that. You need to not value that so much. Those things that come dangerously close sometimes if they are not idols in our life. The Bible tells us that Jesus said, if you don't hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, and all those, 
compared to our love for Him, then you're not worthy. That doesn't mean you've got to hate Him and be mean to Him. But if that relationship with Christ Jesus is not more valuable than those, then your heart is not in the right place. And if that relationship with Jesus Christ is more valuable, more important, and comes first in your life, then all those other things, all those other relationships will be what they should be, will be what He's called them to be, will be blessed by Him. Many times we find believers that get into relationships that they ought not be into. And they go, this is great, this is nice, and it may be the best relationship you've had, but if it's not a godly one, then it's not the best that He has for you. What can we give up? What can we put down? What can we lose in this life that compares with the blessing of Jesus Christ? Even losing our life, even putting our life down, even losing our life, if He so desires to, to do that, to take our lives, to take us home. I've told you guys this before, man, if Jesus showed up right here, right there, and said, all right, who wants to go? Man, I tell you what, I'd be running over the top of you guys to get there. I wouldn't even go around this pulpit. I'd jump right over. Let's go. Take me now. But unfortunately, there are people, there are believers that would say, but wait. My spouse, wait. My kids, wait. My dog? No, not the cat. Um, what would those things be that would hold you back, that would prevent you, that would make you hesitate? To leave this and go be with Him. What do we have to lose in this life that is not worth the blessing of our salvation, let alone the promises of everlasting life with Him? Paul says, I don't consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And we catch a glimpse of that. What would you trade for your salvation? Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation is subject Subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption to the glorious liberty of the children of God. The creation itself is affected by sin. When sin entered through Adam in the garden, creation was affected by that. It's changed. It's different. We were going out there yesterday morning heading up to, to Table Mesa at right about 7 o'clock in the morning and it was just before we left the Denny's parking lot and Danny and I are looking at this beautiful sunrise and the clouds and everything and that, that, that's a great thing. And we look at that and we say, praise God. But that beauty, that that we see, those things that we take in and, and cause us to be inspired cause us to stand in awe of our Creator, are messed up, corrupted, corroded, condemned, contaminated by sin. Not only did when sin entered in the world did it break the relationship between man and God, but it broke creation. It broke creation. <laughs> creation moans and groans and sometimes we understand that earthquakes and things right maybe creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of god when things are renewed when things are put back the way it is creation wants to be redeemed for creation was subject to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope creation was con our Subject to futility. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 3. Verse 
Verse 17. Then to Adam, he said, Because you have hated the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. And in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are. And to dust you shall return. So because of the sin of man, the earth was corrupted, has fallen futile, and delivers thorns, produces thorns and stuff. I mean, you ready to do any gardening? We got a garden out there, unless you stay on top of it, which I'm not real good at. April does it better than I do. Unless you stay out there and cut the weeds and pull the weeds out and do all this stuff like that. It's not long before there's more weeds and thorns and thistles and stuff out there in that garden than there is fruit or whatever it is that you're trying to grow, vegetables and whatnot. And you don't even have to work to produce them. The futility is subjected because of our sin. Verse 21, creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Creation is waiting that time when it is renewed, rebuilt. You can talk about this. It's nothing new, and it's not just a New Testament idea or concept. In Isaiah chapter 65 and 66, Psalm 50, and several other places in the Scriptures talk about a new creation. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 10. But in the day of the Lord, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Keep reading. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, Look to the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Look at Revelation chapter 21. Verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself, God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Yeah, praise God, huh? All of creation moans and it groans waiting to be redeemed, waiting to be renewed, waiting to be recreated, if you will. 
In verse 22 it says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. How many of you have ever delivered a child? Yeah. One thing that, that I understand about birth pains, first of all, I'm very grateful and thankful that I haven't had any. <laughs> but as time goes on, they become more severe and more frequent. And you, you watch this and you see this and you judge and you go, yep, that baby's coming, it's coming soon. Until that child is born. And then there's a relief and a joy that comes. Our situation, our, our present and current times, the, the earth and all of creation is moaning and groaning with birth pains. And I'm sure that believers from Christ till now have watched this and seen things and thought, man, it must be soon. How many of you have been through extra long labor? Or, Nicole, she had one of our, our granddaughters when they were born and everything, and we thought, well, you know, she's in labor. She's just starting and all that stuff like that. I was hungry. Let's go get something to eat. <laughs> we did. About 15, 20 minutes later, we came back. <laughs> you know, happened sooner than we thought. <laughs> April still gives me a hard time about that. Kid's 18 years old. <laughs> but anyhow, those labor pains, no matter how long they last, the pattern holds. It gets worse. And we can look around and we can see certainly that those labor pains are going on now. And it's not just because they have more science and, and ability to track these things, but there are more earthquakes and volcano eruptions and all of those things going on than there ever have been. The earth is shaking. The earth is trembling. Creation is, is shaken about. These birth pains are here. The time is drawing near. It talks about that and it says, in light of these things that all heaven and earth and everything is going to be destroyed and taken away, how ought we to live? How does that affect your life, believer? How does that affect your day-to-day -day life? Knowing that very soon, hopefully very soon, the Lord will come that we will be raptured and out of here. Because that's what happens before the delivery. Kind of like going to get lunch. You know, you're gone. And then when you come back, it's done. How does that make you live? What does that do? How does this affect your life as a believer, as a Christian in this world? knowing that those that do not know the Lord may not have that long. We can sit from here right now and know that we haven't been raptured, so there's at least a, th a seven years tribulation coming. After that, a thousand year reign. We know that the earth won't be destroyed for at least another thousand and seven years. But it's coming. And it's certain. How does that affect our life as believers? Is there a sense of urgency as we'll get into here in a little bit? Is there a sense of urgency for those that are not saved that don't know the Lord? The earth is groaning with the labor pains. <laughs> we talk about this and it, it, uh, who's that Al Gore that's got his global warming things and stuff like that? I believe it. It's going to happen. There's your global warming. Not what they were thinking. There's nothing you can do about it either. It says, For we know that all creation groans and labors. I'm sorry, go back to verse 21. It says, Because creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That liberty is the freedom from that corruption. We still dwell here in these tents, as Paul calls it, these bodies. But we, because we're new creatures born again in Christ, because He went to the cross and paid the price for our sin, because we have life in Him, we are free from the corruption of sin. 
Yeah, these tents, these bodies will pass away one day if we don't get raptured first. But that just means that we're present with Him. We have a liberty, a freedom from the corruption, from the, from the, the bondage of sin in our life. How does that change our life? How does that change the way that we live in the world around us? How does it change our sense of urgency for those who don't know Christ? If all of creation is moaning and groaning, what about us? Not complaining about the way things are, but longing for the righteousness of Christ. Jesus says in the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will, will be filled. And what the world needs to see in all these times and all these things that are going on are believers who trust in their Father and His love for them. Believers that are willing to, to share that hope that they have in Christ Jesus and invite others to join them. Because the birth pains are growing more severe and more frequent.